Um, over the last several months, the Lord has laid upon my heart a topic that I have spent much time in contemplation. It is a topic that perhaps is very familiar with, to us. This topic is how God uses discipline in our lives, of the life of a believer, in order to sanctify us and strengthen our faith. For sure, discipline is not something that we enjoy um, or even like to talk about it many times. <clears throat> um, the topic for our discipline is, is not something that we enjoy. If we had a choice, we would rather skip discipline altogether. We may tell God, no, that's okay. I'm just fine the way I am. Can you sanctify me in some other way? But today I would, would like to uh, look at why fatherly discipline is so incredibly vital and helpful to our walk with the Lord. God has a reason for our discipline. He loves us. He loves and he cares for us as a father would care for a child. Discipline is vital for the growth and development of a child. But in America, I think we all can agree that as a culture, we are reaping the rotten fruit of several generations of children who have not been lovingly disciplined. God loves us too much to let us grow up and become Christian spoiled rotten brats. And so with that, let us turn to Hebrews chapter 12 together. And I will read uh, verses three through 13. And this should be up on the screen. Not all of the, the scripture I'm gonna read will be up the, the, on the screen, but uh, many of the main uh, scriptures will be. So if, we've, uh, if you've made it there, um, Hebrews 12, verse three through 13. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we, we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Now, before we get into fatherly, <coughs> godly discipline, I want to stress the difference between that and natural consequences of sin. Not all suffering that we endure is directly because of God's discipline. Not every situation that we are going through that is difficult and hard to endure is because God has intervened to discipline us on our behalf. Sometimes we simply do sinful and outright right foolish things that incur natural consequences of foolish and sinful behavior. I believe that God uses everything, even natural consequences, to bring change into the life of, the, of a believer. The difference from natural consequences for the believer and the unbeliever is that the unbeliever 
All the suffering from the natural consequences of sin doesn't have a, a happy ending. It is wasted suffering only intended to cause hardship, pain, suffering, and depression. For the believer, however, natural consequences, even though they are part of God's natural order, they can still bring a true believer to repent and grow in their walk with the Lord. I believe that is the difference, and it needs to be stressed. Many times we have made choices in our lives that are just bad decisions. Why? Because you did not ask God, and you did not wait for God's directions at many times. You did not ask others for wise counsel, and sometimes your decisions were just unwise, foolish, out of ignorance, or you're running after your own lustful desires. We have all done this, and some decisions are worse than others, so the consequences can be worse than others. Maybe you have committed a crime and broken the law, and now you face jail time. You were speeding, ran a red light, parked in a handicap zone. Maybe you quit your job because you hated it, or just wanted to have some time to do whatever you wanted. Or maybe you have gone after the things of this world, houses, cars, boats, vacations, and whatever, uh, the list could go on and on. Or you lived beyond, beyond your means, and now you are in financial ruin, in the poorhouse, about to be kicked out on the street. Or perhaps you just can't seem to get ahead. Maybe you married an unbeliever, and now there is strife in the relationship, and perhaps a threat of divorce. Maybe you have divorced a spouse with no biblical grounds to do so, because of your own selfish uh, wants and desires. The list could go on and on. These are things we have done that bring natural consequences. Again, these things very well might be sin. As James says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin, James 4.17. But God is not necessarily disciplining you for everything that brings pain and suffering into your life. We fall into the same old trap many times for being lured by our own sinful desires of the flesh. James also says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James 1, uh, 14 through 15. You see, these things very well might be and probably are sin. And God wants to remove them from you. But there is a difference between the sins you struggle against and hate and wish you could stop and those true attacks from the devil that we struggle against and those sins that we dive headfirst into and that bring natural consequences. Why do we make these kinds of decisions? It is because we think we know what is right and good in our own hearts, all on our own. We feel like we deserve something, so we go get it. In our own heart, every thought and motivation is okay and right, but we must listen to what God says about our hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things. So remember, we cannot trust our hearts, and we must respect the law of the land that we live in, or we may be punished. For Romans 13, 1 through 3 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. <coughs> For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. What you have, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. 
If you are foolish, you may get injured. If you steal, you may go to jail. If you lie and gossip, you may ruin your reputation and others. If you make rash decisions without wise counsel, you may pay for it later. If you are convinced you are doing the right thing, but you just have to keep holding on because it feels right, you may be very sorry later. If you have no self-control, there may be all sorts of natural consequences waiting for you. Again, I want to stress that many of these decisions that we make and actions that we take are probably sinful. But there are, t there are two different results of discipline for the believer and the unbeliever. God has designed this world in such a way that there are natural consequences for every sin. You will pay for them sooner or later. Every person will face consequences whether they are a child of God or not. The author of Hebrews is stressing to us that a child of God the fatherly discipline that we undergo will produce sanctification, wisdom, understanding, strength, and maturity of faith as a fruit of the pain and suffering that we endure. But for the unbeliever, the consequences of sin brings hopelessness, pain, suffering, bitterness, resentment, and anger against God. These two things we cannot confuse. Now for fatherly discipline. As children of God, we have the privilege that the discipline of our sins, and yes, even the consequences of our sins, will not go to waste. God is so good that he uses ev even our sin and outright disobedience to increase our faith and maturity. God disciplines us because he loves us. And we have committed sins that are in direct disobedience to his will, his law, his guidance, and the teaching of the word of God. When you are in direct disobedience to God, he is looking at you like a father to a child. In Hebrews 12 verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? He will bring discipline to you many times if necessary, bringing you to your knees and bringing correction and teaching to you and teaching you the right way to live, to think and act for your benefit. The reason why God has to discipline us as children is because that's exactly what we are, children who need to be taught. Children don't often do what is right and good unless they are corrected and taught not to lie, steal, hit, and so on. You can probably take any of your children for an example. They don't naturally do those good things that we know that they should. We have to teach them. Just as God has to teach us to do what is right, our natural uh, sinful man within us wants to do what is wrong and we, we struggle against that. You, you may know what I'm talking about when I say this statement. We all seem to have that five-year-old living inside of us that wants to come out and stomp our feet and yell and scream and throw a temper tantrum when we don't get our way. That is our natural man that is left within us that we struggle against. This is the battle that goes on with inside against the desire of the Holy Spirit who he has placed within us. If God is not and has not been bringing discipline to you, it could be because you are not a child of God. Verse eight, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So it is a good thing that God is bringing discipline to you. It is a good thing that God is 
having you struggle and go through things and you come out the other side and you have learned something, you've become wiser and God is teaching you. So, what does God want most from the discipline he is performing in you? He wants your repentance and your obedience. He wants your repentance for you to turn from your evil ways and do what is good, which is loving him. How do we love God? John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And what is God's commandments? Mark 12, 28 through 31 says, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked, asked him, which command is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. After this, he also said, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Loving God and loving everyone else as you love yourself is the culmination and spirit of the whole law given by God. He wants you to turn away from your sins and produce righteous fruit. He wants you to come into the presence of God and fall on your face like Isaiah did and mourn over your sin to see how righteous and holy God really is. So you will, you will realize how righteous he wants you to be and to give you more wisdom and understanding of him and his nature. We can turn to uh, Isaiah 5, uh, 1 through 7. It'll also be up here on the screen. And we will see how God really gets Isaiah's attention when he uh, sees a vision of, of God and uh, what goes on here. <clears throat> Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, that one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. The Lord is sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is showing that God is in authority over everything. He is seated and above all things, and there is nothing else needed to be done to gain authority. The train of his robe fills the temple, which shows he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has defeated every nation because the longer the train of the robe of the kings of of olden days, back in the Old Testament, the longer the train of the robe would mean that every time they've de defeated a kingdom or a king, they would add a section on, his, on the train of his robe. So the longer the train, the more he has conquered. God has defeated all kingdoms 
all nations and every so-called king. The seraphim speak of his holiness and glory above any other. The power of their voices shakes the foundation of the threshold and causes the whole house to fill with smoke. What an incredible vision that must have been for Isaiah. It cut him to the heart of the matter. He saw just how wicked and unclean he really was compared to God and the holiness of God. But God cleansed him when he repented. God will cleanse you when you truly repent of your wickedness. So God has the right and authority to train and mold you in any way he desires, by any means he desires, because he is God. Now he will give you trials, tribulations, hardships and struggles, and persecutions to open your eyes. Even Jesus told us that this would come to the true believer to make you see the wickedness in your heart and life and that you need him to be cleansed. In Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Yes, your struggles are very hard and daunting and difficult. He is searching your heart and testing your mind and will. He is causing you to draw nearer to him, making you fall on your knees and at times even on your face so that you will ask God to do the work in you that you could never do yourself, nor would you think of doing it. Verse 9, besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Tell me, would you be as mature in your walk with Christ if he didn't allow these things to happen to you, to force you to seek him on your face in tears at times? I can say for myself, no way, no way would have I ever wanted to walk this, the roads that I've gone through and the suffering that I've gone through in the way I did to gain his wisdom, his knowledge and understanding. Neither would I by my own will or power or self-determination would I do what is good and right. I would have never gotten one inch closer to Christ-likeness. It is God who changes the heart and the mind. In Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Think about it. Take a minute and think of a hard period in your Christian walk and test and see how much growth you went through in that short period of time. When you were walking or crawling through a hard trial in tribulation, I see short periods of time in my life when I grew so much because of a trial or a tribulation. And in between those trials and tribulations, it could be described as, my Christian growth could be described as flatline or very slow growth. But then God would bring another trial and boom, up goes my spiritual growth and God is causing <clears throat> my Christ-likeness to become deeper, wider, higher, and stronger. Brothers and sisters, we must understand why we are going through these trials. It is for your own good, like the discipline and correction of a child. Yes, it is hard. Yes, it is confusing. Yes, it is most painful. And yes, you will not enjoy it. But afterward, 
you will be joyful for the experience and for the growth and you will see how God was there all the time. Verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see, we hold on to many more sins that we have not repented of than we really realize, which the re is the reason for discipline. Until we fall on our face before the Lord with humility and honestly take God's side against ourselves in asking for forgiveness for our many sins. And then God will reveal many more sins that are separating us from him. How do we expect to receive anything we ask for from the Lord if we don't have a clean and pure heart before him? I was listening to a sermon the other day by Pastor uh, Stephen J. Lawson, and he told of a time when he was driving somewhere. He was praying and realized that he had a sin that he had to repent and confess to God. He started praying and confessing that, that sin, and before he knew it, God had revealed to him three more sins that he had to confess. So he repented and confessed those also. Then God started to reveal to him more and more. He wasn't paying much attention to the time, but he thinks that he was confessing sins for over 30 minutes. Consider in your own heart carefully today. Confess and repent your sins to God daily and keep a short account with the Lord. The one thing especially I would recommend to you, humble yourselves before him quickly and often so you will be able to endure your discipline and suffer less natural consequences. If God has set a time for you to have to endure these things, you will have to endure them. Verse seven, it is for discipline that you have to endure. As Paul Washer said, if God has ordained for us to go through a time of suffering, we will go through a time of suffering. But remember, God will bring us out of that valley better than we went in. God's purpose for discipline. Has he been working on you? Has he been pruning your dead, rotting, dry branches? I hope the answer is yes. Are there sins in your life that you still go back to and have to repent of? Yes, we all do. Which means God has much more work to do on us, doesn't he? God's purpose for your discipline goes much deeper than we really realize. Matthew Henry said this about persecutions and afflictions. Man persecutes them because they are righteous. God chastises them because they are not more so. Men persecute them because they will not give up their profession. God chastises them because they have not lived up to their profession. One of the reasons why God chastises us is because he wants us to be more like him. We want to, he wants us to live and breathe and talk and act more like him. Naturally, we, we are not, so he has to discipline us to move us in that direction. He has a purpose and a plan to cut away those things in our lives that displease him, to conform you into his image. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered in every way and was perfect without sin. He grew up in a wicked and cruel world, just like ours. He suffered and endured everything, every single thing that we could possibly go through. This is why he was born into the world and lived in it for 33 years. 
how could he be compassionate and understanding if he came on a Friday, suffered and died, was raised again on a Sunday, and then ascended to heaven shortly after? No, he lived, breathed life, pains, sufferings, trials, tribulations, and persecutions. He endured all of them without sin, perfectly. So now he allows those things to happen to you so you can learn from them. So learn from him. He is perfecting you. Of course, none of us will be perfect any time in our lives, not until he gives us our new body in heaven. But your reward will be great for your trust and faithfulness to him and for the, your obedient work accomplished for him. Dear Christian, you know many of these sins that God still needs to cut away, don't you? They jump into your mind immediately, don't they? I know they do, because they do on my mind as well. Those sins that we struggle against and wrestle with to keep, yes, our flesh wrestles to keep them, though our spirit hates them. We put on a good show, now don't we? How are you today? I'm fine, everything is going good. Yes, really good. Yes, I'm okay. Now, we have another problem here, don't we? We are not being truthful. What does God say or think when he hears us say such things? You liar, you are not okay. You are not good except what is what I have put in you that is good. I am the only one who is good. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Luke eighteen nineteen. We need to understand that we are are not good. The only good that we have within us is what God has put within us. I know that it seems like the struggles are lasting a long time. And it seems at times that it is taking too long for the Lord to take you through the storm after storm. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any shall perish, but that all should reach repentance. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9. The Lord knows exactly what he is doing and will complete his work in you exactly as he intends to. Man's response to God's discipline. Who made you but the God who created the universe, who holds all things together with the word of his mouth? God Almighty, the Lord of creation, who made the land and the sea and the sun and the moon and the stars and every galaxy. Hebrews 1, 2 through 3. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Isaiah forty twenty eight. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. But then there are the two most beautiful words known to man, but God. But God is gracious and merciful and will not let us continue in our rebellion and disobedience. If we are truly his children, he will bring discipline, teaching, and correction to bring us back to the narrow way, 
the path that leads to life, his ways. It has been said that he pursues us, that he chases us, and sometimes he has to drag us back to the place we need to be because we have gone astray. How does he do this? God causes us to suffer through trials. Depression, hardships, struggles, loss, attacks, tribulations and persecutions and the like. He does all these things to force us to let go of those sins that normally we would not let go of. He batters and bruises us until we are on our knees. And if we keep holding on to them, he puts us on our face or sometimes on our backs. Verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Philippians 2, 1 through, through 11 should be up on the screen. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any partic participation in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, complete my joy be be by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing with selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is, in, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is in control of all things. Do you not know that he has control over every aspect of your life? Every single thing that has happened to you and every single thing that will happen in your life, he knows and he will take care of you. Growing shaping, strengthening you to make you into what he wants you to be. In conclusion, the question is, will you trust him? Will you obey him? Will you lean on him? Let him do his good work through you in these trying times. Or will you resist him his plan, his purpose in your life? Will he have to run after you because you are going your own way? Will he have to teach you the same thing over and over again? One thing that I really hope for you, really hope in my life when I go through struggles is that I will learn my lesson. And I pray that for you too, that you will learn your lesson, the lesson God is trying to teach you. I believe that every hardship, everything that we go through, God has a lesson to teach you, teach us. I would not want you or me to have to go through that again. Send your roots deep into God's word and believe all his promises. Seek his guidance and direction in your life. Don't fall behind following the world and don't run ahead of him thinking you know what he wants. 
as a conclusion, I would like God to speak directly to us from his word. So I will be reading a few passages of scripture to conclude that won't be up here on the screen. Psalms 1. <clears throat> Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the springs of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Galatians five sixteen through 23. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. And those are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do, do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And finally, Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. May the Lord bless us with his word. Let's close in prayer.